of a gentleman at various stages of his life and uh, from top to bottom we can see that years have treated you reasonably well. Would you agree? And uh, next thing I wanted to put on the screen is a few milestones. Uh, so I'll do a bit of introduction here first and then you will be the main speaker from there on. Uh, So everything started in, in Norwich, uh, on the east coast of England, in 1940, and we jumped 17 years forward. And in 1957, you took, I, I believe, what you believe to be an excellent skiffle group to London for an audition. You, you can talk about that in a minute later on. Then uh, you were the first British rock and roller to go to Hamburg. Of course, Hamburg. After that, you went in June 1960, I believe. Sorry? You went in June 1960. June 1960. Yeah. And then uh, many, many others followed, of course, over the next few years. And uh, everybody knows about the 1961 events in, uh, with Bert Genfert and the Beatles. And then you have remained in Germany and you still live in that country now. Oh, I've lived there. I've lived all over. Hello, hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. No, I've, I've lived all over the world, Hickey, in the States, in the, I don't know where, and this and that, and done crazy things because I'm not a normal musician. I'm a vagabond, and I travel, you know, I, I used to travel with a gun in one hand and a guitar case in the other, but that was Vietnam. You know. Yeah, but before, before then, of course, Although you were not a Londoner yourself, but London was a very crucial starting point for your musical career. Uh, I, I put up now this... Uh, you, you were managed by Larry Barnes, at least at some stage. And of course Larry Barnes was, was a very important musical manager in the UK at the time. And everybody can see many familiar names on the screen. People who belong to this same stable. Everybody with a very fancy artistic name, and in brackets you can see those people's real names. Everybody had to sound very exciting and, and heroic, etc. But maybe you can now talk about that time when you went to London, what started to happen uh, in this coffee bar uh, sequence, etc. Two eyes. Two eyes coffee bar. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, we don't have enough time to really get deeply into all this, you know, but being born in the war in Britain and growing up in, in a very austere atmosphere, very little to eat, you know, nothing, no toys, nothing to play with. All we heard was George Formby sometimes, but when the Americans came to visit us, we were listening to Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald and blue, jazz and blues. And so in a way, when, the same happened to John Lennon, say, in Liverpool. Yeah. When we were little boys, we, we had big ears because there was nothing else. Yeah. And we had big hun hungry stomachs as well. But So we were listening to all this American influence that we were hearing from the troops, the American troops. Where I lived, it was full of Americans. You know. And uh, the thing was, um, the Americans were helping the British, of course, in the war against the Nazis, of course, flying over and bombing Germany and coming yeah. back. And, 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 um, but the, the British and the Americans didn't necessarily get on with, it, with one another. Uh, you know, the, the Americans were not popular. They had lots of money, they had lots to eat, and they got all the girls, you know, and the, yeah. the British guys were dying in the war, and the Americans had nicer uniforms, they yeah. looked, they looked, and they sound like Spencer Tracy. Or somebody, yeah. you know, so. they, they had Coca-Cola in the yeah. barracks, etc. So, and uh, coming from Norwich, I come from Norwich, and that's a very conservative place, very conservative in those days. And it, it, it really meant uh, that when rock and roll came along and skiffle and all that stuff, everybody went, oh, no, 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 don't play that. You know? I said, I, I want a guitar, to, to my mother. I said, I want a guitar when I was 15 or 16. And she, she said, you are not getting a guitar. You are a violinist. 
I was actually, but I hated, I loved music, but I hated the violin, because it's a stupid instrument. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. Okay, it's good in Scotland, but um, I wanted to be, I heard this message from above. God spoke to me, or somebody did, and they says, Tony, don't worry, everything will be all right. You are going to get a guitar. So I did get a guitar, because I stole it. <laughs> well, not exactly. But when I, at school, I, I borrowed a clarinet. And I took the clarinet that belonged to the school down to, the, to a pawn shop. And they had a guitar hanging in the window. And I looked at it 200 times. And I says, can I give you the clarinet and you'll give me the guitar? The guy said, yes, because he knew the clarinet was worth a lot more than the guitar. And uh, I thought, well, now I'm going to learn the guitar very quickly. I'm going to earn some money, play in the pub or something, yes. buy back the clarinet and go and put it back where I found it. Yeah, the the way it, it, it didn't work out that way because the, the police came up to see my mother and said, what sort of son have you got? You know, and so, and, but the headmaster of the school, he said to my mother, get the boy a guitar. So I got a guitar. But I had to be dramatic, because it was the only way to do it. There was no other way. Yeah, but you did it, yeah. So having a guitar now, uh, then I was learning very quickly. My fingers were already hard from violin playing, you know. And, um, so I had a skiffle group, I formed a skiffle group. This is a, all quick now, I can't tell you everything, but then we, we decided to go down to London because London in Soho was the only place anything was, anything was happening. You know, it was, it was the, the mecca, if you like, the, the center of uh, uh, bubbling under rock and roll, British rock and roll, just being born, just being born. There weren't many of us from the whole country. There was Joe Brown and there was, uh, Bruce Welch and Cliff and Terry Dean and Lil Wee Willie Harris and a few other people who are still alive actually. Yeah, one, one thing that I had thought until I learned better was that I thought that the, almost everybody was a Londoner there, but of course there are examples like up, up here, uh, Hank Marvin, Bruce Welch came from Newcastle, which I didn't know. The only guy from London was Tommy Steele. Well, and, but he was a big name, of course, the first, he first was a, big He name. was the first one, of yeah. course, yes, yes. But, then, he, but he was only accepted by the media, by the radio, etc., because he was a comedian as well. Yeah, so he was, was sort of in a way, he was, uh, enter he was entertaining the public because the people did not want uh, British musicians to play rock and roll. And that's what he became, Tommy Steele, an all-round entertainer, of course, very, yes. very quickly. Oh, yes, he's a bit... A but big then, man. then... Uh, this two eyes coffee bar in, in Soho, that, that was the kind of, kind of uh, central point of the late 1950s rock and roll in Britain. And in fact, the, 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 the picture on the top left, I believe, is taken in the two eyes co coffee bar. So tell us a little bit about that. I, I suppose it was like there you could get into real rock and roll. You didn't have to compromise with any other types of music. Well, it was the first opportunity to sort of play before a, 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 every evening in, in front of an audience who had probably never seen you before. And this way we, we, we were sort of getting some fans and we, we caused the, the, um, we got the attention of a few people in television. Jack Good, for instance, yes. and he came down to the Two Eyes and he said, I, want, I need some, somebody for my show. He was an Oxford graduate, yes. you know, and Jack Good, so he spoke like this. Tony Sheridan, I would like you to appear on my show. It's called the Oh Boy Show. I says, yes. How much are you going to give me? He says, five pounds, which was a lot of money in those days to me. Five pounds? Great, okay. So, um, so I, suddenly I was on television, and I was playing not acoustic guitar, but lead guitar. Yeah. And I was the first one to be allowed to play lead guitar on British television. Yeah. No mistakes. So I was a fanatic, but I was doing it well, you know. And I've, all the way along, I always felt I was being pulled 
to, to somewhere other in the future. I had no ambition to be a big star. I, I, I was not interested in being Cliff Richard or Elvis or something. I was just loving the life of being free. What well, music gives you the opportunity to be free, real freedom. That means nobody tells you what to do. You've got no boss. You are your own boss, and you you can you go any way you want to go. Yeah. Did, the, did you play in several bands, or did you form your own band, or how how did that side of it develop? Well, um, I was backing an American artist yes. at a pretty early stage, you know, yeah. in, in the fifties already. Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran, I was with them on tour and was with Conway Twitty and Johnny Preston yeah. and people like that on tour. So, so there, was, there were not many people doing what I did. Yeah. Only a handful of people in the whole country. So somebody, I, somebody had to get the ball rolling. Yeah. And the next ball that I got rolling was in Hamburg to, yeah. go, to go there. I have, I have here a comment by Jimmy Page. I took this from a book. And he, he said that the only English guitarist who was any good during that time was Tony Sheridan. So you got rather uh, high, high level uh, and respectful comments from the skills that you showed at the time. Well, I'll tell you something. The thing was, uh, if, if you were recognized by somebody on your own level, that meant much more than fame or money or something. Yeah. So Jimmy Page saying something nice, th this is worth uh, a lot more to yeah. me. And uh, there were very few people who were sort of uh, doing this stuff at the, yeah. in those days. But then you then you said that Hamburg was calling next. How, I, how did that? I heard, how did that originally begin? That I heard the call in my heart. <laughs> From whose mouth? From the <laughs> enemy. My mother said, "You are going to where?" I said, uh, "Germany." You know they killed your grandfather in the First World War in France. Your mother was born, he was already dead when your mother was born. And then in the Second World War we got 57 people died in the family and all this. And I said, uh, yes I know that mother, but um, I want to go to Hamburg. Because uh, I, have, I have a feeling it's the right thing to do. So I went to Hamburg and... Um, the great thing about playing rock and roll for teenagers, if you like, and people my age, was to patch up all this old stuff. The Nazi thing, you know, it's gone. Yeah. And we, are, we were all, all kids suffering from the effects, the after effects of war. Which, whichever nationality you were. But it, so, whichever nationality you represented, you, you had suffered from it indirectly. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was terrible on both sides, and it was awful, awful, awful. So rock and roll sort of uh, patched things up a bit. So we played for the kids who realized all of a sudden, we're not enemies. We, you know, whatever their parents were telling them about the British or something, was all rubbish. I mean, the, the older people didn't like us either, you know, in Germany, but, but the kids did. And Germany... So we, we got a ball rolling, so many Germans young musicians started to think about playing, getting a, a guitar. And they welcomed you with Even all the Even if they had to steal it, you know. Well, they have to learn from somebody. I mean, all of a sudden, they, they were sprouting out of the ground like, like flowers, you know. Yeah. Um, it was very necessary for somebody to go to Hamburg. Looking back, it's easy to say I can see exactly what was going on. And I... Um, Somebody had to play the role of Tony Sheridan. I still don't know who Tony Sheridan is, but looking back, I can see that somebody had to do that, not even think about it, just do it. Yeah, play suppose, all night. Suppose you can say that they were historic events, but we only know afterwards that they, they became historic. Yes. While they were happening, nobody had any idea about that. Well, nobody had any, because everybody was saying in those days, in Britain and in the States, and in Germany too, the, all the record uh, executives and the A and R men, and the, and the, you know record producers and all that, they were all saying, "Tony, rock and roll has got maybe one more year to live, then it's finished." This rock star, you know, and being then, then you'll go back to your violin. And, what? You would then go back to your violin after rock and roll is finished. No, I didn't consider that option. Ah, okay. The violin was gone forever. 
I was so happy, I didn't even say goodbye. I don't know where my violin is now, but you want to, you want to buy a violin? Anyway. You'll name the price. But um, looking back, I'm, I'm a little bit proud, not of the fact that I did anything special or something, but I, I was being used by, uh, by um, I don't know, you can call it fate, if you, kismet or, or whatever. You know, the Germans have a word for coincidence. And it's Zufall, Zufall, yeah. and it means to fall, to fall into place, if you like. And it's a much nicer word than coincidence. So I don't believe in Zufälle anymore. So everything that happened, happened for a reason. I'm, I, I'm a great believer in this. I'm a spiritual person too, yeah. and I went to India looking for a master, and I found one, and all this stuff, you know. Yeah. So a very unusual life. But um, looking back, I can see that uh, Somebody had to be crazy enough to do these things and, and inspire other guys too and to sort of um, be a musician without... Most musicians from Liverpool especially, the first thing for them was to sort of be seen on stage or to, to have some sort of profit or the money or something, I don't know what, or impress the girls or something. But for me, it was just a question of doing my best every time and uh, sort of, in a way, just getting into a... They used to say, Tony is in ecstasy again, you know. That meant I was in my trance or something. Yeah. And I was, you know. The long version of what I say, two minutes, 14... Uh, two hours, 14 minutes. That was the long version of what I say. Now I'm laying on the floor. Germans were going. <laughs> poor boy. Which, which venues in Hamburg did you go to when you first went to play in Hamburg? The first club was called the Kaiser Keller, yeah. which was a cellar, yeah. the black hole. And uh, okay, but it was wonderful to have what, what we found most attractive about going to Hamburg to play was that we could play all night, we could play as loud as we wanted, we could make mistakes, we could sing the wrong words, we could insult the audience at the same time, yeah. and, and all this stuff, and we did it, and it was wonderful to be able to do that. And through all these hours, playing all night, you became interested in innovation then, you know, yeah. improvising, and being creative, that was a great, gift, if you like, that Hamburg gave to, say, the British music scene. So anybody who went through Hamburg, and many, many did, it was the Kaiser Keller, then the top ten yeah. club on the Reeperbahn, which was a more respectable place. So yeah. the, the older businessmen used to come there with their young secretaries and things like that, you know. So um, for, their, for their seminars, so. Yes, yes, yes. Is it? All, all very respectable stuff. Yes. And, uh, after that, it was the... Uh, it was um, the Star Club, and I said to my mother once on the phone, I said, Mother, I'm playing next to a, a church. It's uh, a Catholic church in, in St. Pauli, in Germany. St. Pauli? Well, that sounds all right to me, St. Paul. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. Indeed. So, and then I invited my mother over to, I brought her over to Hamburg. And she was and impressed. I, and I took her to the respectable places. <laughs> I didn't show her some of that stuff. You know? yeah. It would have shocked her, but we, I showed it, I went, we went to a Bavarian Sinatar, it's called, on the Reaper Bar, a Bavarian with a Bavarian band, and, yes. you know, yes. and she was very impressed by this. Very good. And she saw me singing, and she said, Anthony, she called me Anthony, she, she, she said, can't you sing a little more, perhaps, folk songs? <laughs> British folk songs? Irish folk songs? Anything? Uh, I, I says, Mother, uh, I'm sorry, but you know, this, this, is, this is my job, I'm, this is my calling, you know. I'm, an, I'm a rocker, you know. I'm one of the nicer rockers, you know, because you, you have other rockers too who you don't want your mother to see. The nice ones. But I'm still respectable on the outside, you know. I'm, I'm wearing my tie and jacket and everything. But later I put on the leather jacket and the leather trousers with the Beatles. Yeah. And we didn't look very respectable at all. But she, my mother never saw that. 
and the, the Beatles, what I understand is that uh, you were playing at the top ten. I, I mean, they followed you after two months after you went to, to Hamburg. They came in August first time. And you, obviously, British guys, you sort of got together. You played at the top ten, I, I believe, at that time, when you met them. Yeah, well, the thing with the Beatles was, um, when they arrived to play at the uh, Indra, nobody went to the club to see them or listen to them. You know, what's the name of the group? Beatles. <laughs> I don't want to go there. The, the, the name was enough to turn off the German audience. Yeah. Because it sounded like a, 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 a rude word in German. Beatles, you know. Yeah. Male sexual organ. Wow, thank you. Thank you for this. Anyway, clarification. But, but the, the, yes, yes. But the, the thing was that you, the, the Beatles, uh, they had to go through that stage where everybody sort of uh, ignored them, if you like. Nobody yeah. was interested in them. But when they came back later, yeah. and the, the club owner in the top ten, he says, Tony, would you agree to play with this guy, with this group from Liverpool called the Beatles? And I thought about it for two seconds. I says, yes. <laughs> yes, I'll do that. And how, how long do we have to... He said, well, four or five months. You know, every night. Eight hours a night, sometimes ten. Yeah. Or even longer. Yeah. Sometimes it was six to six at the weekend. Six yeah. in the evening to six in the morning. And, and you did that? <laughs> for weeks and months with them? Uh, yes, yes, yes. And is yes. that when... But th this is when they d discovered themselves, their own creativity, their own magic, if yeah. you like. Without, yeah. without this gig at the top ten, they would not have discovered themselves. Because John Lennon was uh, basically, he'd given up. Yeah. He, he thought, I mean, he didn't look the part, he didn't sing the part. Yes. He wasn't a good guitar player. Yeah. And the, the, the fact that he, he was with Paul, McCartney and Lennon, I mean, the, the, this uh, was a, a very magic chemical reaction with yeah. these two guys. Yeah. They, they, well, they were using each other. There was no love. Like spying part. There was no love in those days. You know, yeah. we didn't love each other. Yeah. And it was egos. egos. Big, juicy egos. All right. So that John Lennon's juicy, big ego was talking to Paul McCartney's Big, juicy musical ego, too. But, and, and of course, it was very productive. Yeah, the, and the so, sum, sum of those two was more than one plus one when, when these egos joined together. Absolutely. Yeah. It was more like five, actually. Yeah. One and one makes five. Good. Of course, when George Martin came in, it was like uh, he was not one more Beatle, he was like four more or yeah. something. Yeah. So, um, Obviously, the, these guys were um, looking back. It's easy to say all these things, you know, um, but um, the world needed the, the Beatles. That's yeah. for sure. They definitely needed the Beatles. Yeah, but what it is was that to prove that all the guys had been saying one more year of rock and roll, guys, then it's finished. Yeah, you, then you're going to have to do pop or <laughs> schlager or something yeah. else, you know. And of course, it was only the beginning, and then the British rock scene started in a, in earnest, and um, changed the world too. But the Beatles alone, they changed the world just to, on their on their own. And was it when, when, when you played with them at the top ten? Was that when Bert Kempfert saw you, heard you play with them, and, and, and then came up this idea of recording? Yes. Where you were the you were the artist, and they were the That's right. band. Yes. Of yes. Course, Time. So what? How well, did he come to? How did you come to find out about you and them, and the the, the, the good way that you, you played and sang together? Well, there, there were the, there was a, the uh, the publisher called Alfred Schacht, who was a uh, he's dead now. So, but I don't want to say anything bad about him. But uh, he ripped us all off anyway, and he was also the publisher for Bert Kempford, etc., etc. And they had a singer called Tommy Kent, who was sort of, uh, I don't know, pop, you know, German pop or something. You know? Yeah. You know, not rock and roll. There was yeah. no rock and roll in Germany. There's nothing. You know. I think German language is not too suitable for rock 
doesn't lend itself to, to rock and roll, the German language. Yeah. People have tried. <laughs> it sounds awful. <laughs> so anyway. Anyway, so uh, Tommy Kent told Bert Kempford and, and Alfred Schacht that they should come to the top ten to listen to the, this this band of gypsies there, which we, we were, you know. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, something impressed Bert Kempford. He was a musician himself, so he could hear basically the, what was possible, in a way. Yeah. Although he had no inclination for being a, an avant-garde sort of producer or something. That was not his, his, his game was to make uh, some recordings and sell them, yeah. sell them to Polydor. Business. His wife was a business lady, yeah. you know, and uh, so it was basically money, but he, he also heard, the musician in, in him heard the musicians in us too. Yeah. And he didn't know what to do with it. He, he, he of, also was a skillful songwriter, of course. Yes, yeah. oh, yes, of course he was. Yeah. He was a very good musician, musician but uh, a completely different type of music. But um, all, he also believed that rock and roll had a, at the most a year to live. And he said to me, Tony, uh, Tony, I want to make a contract with you. The band, we don't need the Beatles. You know. But uh, uh, your next record, Tony, should be in German. Yeah. I said, okay. <laughs> it, was, it was called Ich lieb dich so. And it was the German version of Ecstasy from Benny King, you know, which is a lovely song. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did it great, I did it all right, you know. Yeah. Because I was, so I had to switch overnight, suddenly from being a, a, a leather jacketed rock and roller into a respectable looking guy who was singing Ichlitik so and all this stuff, you know. So, uh, that one must be a collector's was, item today. Was, what? That's Ichlitik so. Record must be a collector's item today. Oh yes, you can find it. Yes, exactly. Yes, well, it's a, mo a milestone, if you like. But then, but of course, they were all wrong. Rock and roll was not going okay. to die. Of course, we know it now. So he made the mistake of giving the Beatles away. Yeah. And uh, not recording any more with them. Yeah. Because he didn't know what to do with them. And in Britain, nobody knew what to do with them either. And how how in practice did the recording session go? I mean, what did you, how many songs, how quickly, one day or more time spent on doing it or? Well, in, in those days you could make a, an LP with, say, ten songs in an afternoon. No problem. The fact is we were playing so, we played so often, so many hours, so many nights, so many weeks together. together yes. We were per you did, yeah. perfect. Yes, yeah. There were no mistakes. And that meant today, you know, you go in, you put down the drum, drums, then you put the bass down, and then, you know, and the, we played exactly the same way in the studio as yeah. we played on stage. Yeah. yeah. We, did, we did nothing different. We just did the, the thing on the stage as if we were already playing in, in the club. Yeah. And it was very fast. So very like fast, yeah. Two, two takes of this, two takes of that, two takes of that. Yeah. And uh, what's the next one? I don't know. What should we do? Yeah. The Saints go marching in for the Germans, so they know the song. The Saints go marching in. Yes. They know my Bonnie. Yeah. They learned that at school, you know. So, yeah. so it was sort of done very quickly. There was not sort of a lot of planning involved. Um, I, I do regret that looking back. We could have because we were very together. We were a very, very good rhythm and blues band. Yeah. That, you know, the leather jackets, and it was getting a bit black, the music, or yeah. the, the, Ray Charles was our idol, Ray Charles. Yes. And other black singers too, Larry Williams, etc., etc. Yeah. So the band was sounding very black yeah. for a British band, and it got that way in Hamburg. Mm. And we, what we should have done is record the band as it sounded on, you know, all the, doing all these other numbers. This juice bluesy stuff, you know. Yeah. Yes. How many? Nobody. See, that was his mistake too, Kempford. He should have thought about uh, this possibility. Yeah. Recording us live. Of course, they, the equipment was not there in those days. Right. We didn't even have the right PA system, you know, microphone system. Yeah. It was all very, I don't know, very primitive indeed. And we couldn't hear ourselves sing. There were no monitors like we have today. Yeah. 
So you had to sing with your finger in your ear so you could hear your own voice. So I'm singing like this. You know, I'm trying to play guitar at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, that, that way you can hear your voice, you know. And then you could, because you have to, if you're a singer, you have to control your voice, and yes. you, otherwise you sing out of, out of tune and all yeah. this stuff. How many songs did you do together, or rec record together with the Beatles in that session? Seven? Yeah, because I, I have a question somebody asked me to ask you. You mentioned uh, Bert Kempfert's wife, a businesswoman, and uh, this person who asked me to ask you a question said that you had, you had spoken with his widow afterwards, uh, do you know if if she has or she had in an archive any any songs you had recorded that haven't been published, launched? I'm sure she's heard that question a hundred times. Yeah, but you don't know the answer to it. No, no, no. I don't. I'm, I'm afraid I don't. Okay. I, I suspect there is nothing that we don't uh, know about. Would be surprising in a way. It would be great. It. Wouldn't it be lovely? Yes, yes, yes. But uh, yes. I think I told you, I mentioned that, uh, what's his name, uh, Ertigan, Ahmed Ertigan from Atlantic, Atlantic, Records. Atlantic Records, which was Ray Charles' label. Yes. He came over, or they, he sent somebody over to, you know, to, to see what we were sounding like, and that was, uh, I almost got the chance to go to America then, in the 60s, and, and uh, do some recording, yeah. but I was already contracted to Polydor and somehow the business thing didn't work out, you know. Yeah. But that would have been one of, but the time wasn't right. I went to the States much later in 78. Yeah. 1978. Yeah. I went to live there in LA. For how long? For a year. Just oh. about a year. Then yeah. I, I escaped. Oh. <laughs> I escaped. Uh, jumping so, from one thing to another, you, you mentioned America and staying there. You had a very interesting episode in your life serving in Vietnam. Yes. But, but in, in a very interesting capacity. So maybe you talk about that a little. Well, um, how shall I put it? I mean, St. Pauli in Hamburg. I'm sure if you, if you know St. Pauli, you know it's the red light district. Uh, and it's, it's, it, it has uh, it's some positive sides, but very few. And the rest of it is, you know, and uh, not nice people. You know, I used to get beat up sometimes. You know, two guys would jump on me and start hammering me because the, because the girls preferred the uh, British musicians. They liked the musicians instead of the stupid waiters <laughs> who were all bodybuilders, you know. Yeah. yeah walking around on this, you, you want a Coca-Cola? Maybe you need two, you know. I mean, if you sat in the star club with a coke the whole night, I mean, sooner or later they're going to make you leave or yeah. hit you. Yeah. You know, this, was, this happened every night. A very unpleasant place. Yeah. So I stayed seven years in, in not living in St. Pauli, yeah. living outside somewhere, but working in St. Pauli until I felt that, I felt that the whole scene, the seven year cycle was, heralding the end of it all. And I was right. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the, the star club was uh, eventually burned down and all this stuff. Yes. And I was happy. I was the only guy who was happy to see the star club go. Nice. You know, in the, in the way it went. Yeah. It deserved to burn up, to get burned. Mm -hmm. You know, it deserved that. The top 10 is still there. God bless it. And the, the place we lived uh, under the roof upstairs on the, on the third floor, under the roof uh, in the attic yes. with the Beatles, you know, in the most primitive state. Nobody took care of us in those days. We were sort of like antisocial, um, uh, you know. And then how would this lead to the subject of Vietnam? Sorry? How does this lead us to Well, the... I'm just getting to yeah. that. So seven... I thought so, but just seven... reminded you. No, I... <laughs> I was, I was going to say seven years of uh, St. Pauli was enough for anybody. You know, it was enough. I don't know if it was burnout, it was burn, burn, burnout, actually. You know, it was something like that. And I, th I thought to myself, S uh, something's going to happen soon. Well, you know, where shall I go? You know, what, what shall I do? Because the whole scene was sort of collapsing. 
Yeah. I mean, it had been most, very effective in many, many ways, including the Beatles, of course, but, but uh, it was finished, and I felt that. And suddenly, somebody came up to me, and Mr. Mr. Brown, his name was Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown had been sent by uh, the Americans in Vietnam to, to find round-eyed white musicians yes. who would agree to go to Vietnam for two months yes. to play for the American troops. Yeah. And uh, I thought about it for three seconds. I said, yes. <laughs> Great, where do we leave? Okay, and so I had to, you know, Next thing I know, I'm, I'm in Hong Kong and Manila or somewhere on the way to Vietnam. And, uh, and um, I'm, I'm suddenly in this war theater where all the guys, 18 years old, they don't want to be there. The American generals had thought, we need this white music. and We need American music, even if it's the British plan. Yeah. But we need American music to keep up the morale of the troops. Yeah. So we can kill a few, a few more thousand Viet Vietnamese, you know. And this is the way, the stupid way they were thinking. Yeah. I mean, any psychologist will tell you, if you play music for troops who don't want to be there, you're going to make them cry, oh, make them sad, make them homesick, yeah. and they won't, they won't <coughs> want to pick up the gun the next day either, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the effect of music, I'm, I'm not ashamed of having played for a war effort. Yeah. For me, it was not a war effort. For me, it was the first public in my life who understood the language I was seeing, they understood the feel, the bluesy thing that I love, yeah. um, <clears throat> understood the sort of the groove and all these things, you know. Yeah. And they could have, they could have uh, said, Tony, maybe you should play folk music. So, but they all said, Tony, sounds great, man. Yeah. Give, us, give us some more of that feeling, man, you know. So you feel so, so for me, <coughs> For me, that made my, my day. I, I thought, oh, great, they, they accept me. I wanted to be accepted by... You accepted the audience for you there. Uh, yes, I wanted to yeah. stop being a second-hand musician, yeah. playing second-hand music. Yeah. And by that time, I'd stopped copying Chuck Berry and all the rest of them. So I was sounding like me then. Yeah. You know? So they accepted me. And that was the most in, one of the most important things in my life. Yeah. In Vietnam, playing to a, a public who who loved what I was doing, they thought they thought I was crazy. Tony, you volunteered to come to Vietnam? Are you crazy? I says no. This is great, lovely. And, and so I finished up staying there eighteen months. And for your efforts, a and long time. The first the first tour I did was sort of over one year. Yes. And the American troops, the young guys, only had, to, only had to stay there for one year. I mean, only. You know, but they, that was their duty to, to perform, to kill, kill people for one year there. Yeah. And then they could leave and go back home and be treated like shit in their own country again. Yeah. It was awful. But uh, I stayed there longer than a soldier needed to do. And then I went to Australia with my Australian girlfriend, who was a dancer with an Australian band in yes. Vietnam. So we went to Sydney and uh, I'm trying to recover from my Vietnam stint. And didn't, uh, didn't the Americans uh, acknowledge your role there by giving you an honorary military rank as well? Yes, they did. They did, yes. Uh, yes. But I was going to say, I lived in Sydney for a few months and I got so bored in this very British town in Australia, you know, it was like living in London yeah. or, or in Norwich. <laughs> it was, you know, and it was boring. And so I went back to Vietnam, I missed it. I missed yeah. it. I missed the excitement, the danger. Yeah. Very dangerous. And I, one of my gigs, my, one of my regular gigs was playing for gunship pilots, helicopter pilots, who would go up and uh, shoot whatever is moving, cows. Yeah. Or oh, temples, Buddhist temples, they used to shoot anything but for target practice, yeah. you know, to keep the guns moving, or else. But anyway, I played for, a, for a, uh, one of the, this unit, I think it was about 200 men or something, you know. And, uh, and the boss was a, a black man, a, a very nice officer, yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Thompson. 
And um, he says, uh, we, we used to stay up, stay up all night drinking his brandy, his French cognac, you know. So we were talking bullshit the whole night. And then I would go to bed then, and he would suddenly say, well, I've got work to do now. Without sleep, he'd get up and do his normal job. I was very impressed by that. But sooner or later, he said to me in my band, you know, two guys in the band, a German on the bass, a, a, a real nutcase, a, a crazy man, and a, another crazy Irishman on the drums. So we were three crazy musicians. And he says, I'm gonna, he says, I, I'm, I want to give you a little recognition and I want to make you guys honorary officers of the US forces. Yeah. Uh, and we said, well, great, well, what does that mean? He says, well, I'm going to have everything typed out in six copies or whatever. Some of the copies goes to the States in the records and then we keep, and you get a copy too. And here's, what would you like to be, Tony? Um, and I thought, well, I don't know, well, what, what, what can I, what would you, what do you think? What, what do you think I am? They says, he says, well, um, uh, uh, a Lieutenant would be a little, not enough, I think you should, Possibly be a captain, Tony. Yeah. Captain Sheridan sounds good. Yeah. I says, okay, okay. So he's got it all. This is all official. You know? Yeah. All typed right there. Captain Tony Sheridan. Yeah. O, O3 is the rank. O3. Yeah. Means captain. Sounds and impressive. To my drummer, who was older than I was, my drummer from Dublin, a little, yeah. little guy from Jimmy with little short arms, he used to play like this. And. Um, Colonel Thompson said to him, um, now Jimmy, what about you? you? You're from Ireland, aren't you? Well, what do you, do you feel you would like to be um, a captain like Tony or something? And, and Jimmy says, well, I'm a bit older and uh, I've, I've seen a bit more in my life. Um, and so the, uh, Cap, uh, Mr. Thompson said, uh, well, be, be a major, John. You know, Jimmy, <laughs> you are now Major Doyle. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> and the, the next guy, my German bass player, he was actually an officer in the German army before they threw him out. Yes. They threw him out. You know, he was too mad. Yes. Too mad. And he says, I am, a, I am a German officer. I was in the German army and I was serving my time and I was a lieutenant and I want to stay a lieutenant. <laughs> and Colonel Thompson says, okay, Fogger, uh, you are now Lieutenant Tontorf. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. So that from that day on, then we we had uniforms. You know, it was fun. You know, with patches all over, colours and things, and uh, you know. And, and now we need to call you sir. Right? Yeah, but not necessary. Not really necessary. <laughs> and then, but we had guns too. Yeah. And but we never used them. Yeah. And then. I must tell you one, uh, one, the, the one thing that I think that kept us alive over there, because it was very dangerous. Yeah. Flying helicopters was very dangerous. Traveling on the ground was very dangerous. Any sort of travel. Most of the guys in Vietnam, they were sent to one outpost or unit, and they stayed there for one year. Yeah. And if they were lucky, they didn't get any problems. But if they were unlucky, they got problems every day. Yeah. You know, so it was very different. And um, coming, I, I had to go to Hong Kong once to renew our visas for the, to come back to work in Vietnam. I think I told you about that. Yes. So I'm coming back from Hong Kong, I'm sitting in, this, in the plane next to a Vietnamese student from, from the university in, in Saigon. Yeah. And he was talking to me, and we were talking, you know, for an hour at least, you know, having a drink and everything. And he says, Tony, would you, would you mind putting down on paper your feelings about uh, what you do over here, playing for the troops and uh, et cetera, and what, what sort of effect do you think it has on the troops? And uh, do you think it helps the war effort, uh, the American war effort, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And I, sa I, sa I, sa I says, yes, I, I will write a few pages for you, exactly what I feel and experience and everything else, yeah. and my opinion about a few things as well. Yes. So I wrote all this down, and I gave it to him in Saigon. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, met, we met up. And looking back, a, a, a couple of years later, I had this feeling, 
like many students, he was he was he was a student in the daytime, but at night he was a Viet Cong or something. You know. oh, I see. Many of them were doing that. Yeah. Uh, for idealistic reasons. So. They beat the French, you know, and yeah. they threw the Japs out and, and all this stuff. And then, so they were getting ready to throw the Americans out and nobody yeah. believed that. But uh, then I think because I, I gave him my opinion on paper, I think he said to his uh, commanders or yeah. whatever, leave Tony Sheridan alone. So I'm, I'm very sure that that saved my life. Yeah. Now, there, there may be questions from the audience. I, I mean, I've been talking with you all this time. Well, we so don't have enough time. We have yeah, time for... We, we still don't have worry about time. that. Yeah. Don't worry Ask about that. Ask if, if there's some questions. You're some questions. Can I shout now? Can I shout now? Can I shout now? Yeah. I'm curious because I spoke to Simon and Andrew Bell, and he was saying to keep playing for 6 or 7 hours a night. There was all these unpleasant. You mean the little white pills? Well, you know, we didn't eat very much. And uh, for John that was good because he lost a lot of weight. He looked better when he was thin, John. Uh, we were all very thin. George was like a skeleton, you know. And the reason was we used to drink a lot of beer because we were thirsty on stage. So we're putting in the beer and we're sweating it out again. You know, uh, everything was wet. and. Uh, we weren't eating very much, but we had to stay awake and we had to sort of uh, go through all these hours and do it well and uh, do a give our best and everything. So these little white pills came into our lives. Somebody says, uh, you, you, want a, you want some, uh, you want a pill, man? Uh, what do you mean a pill? Oh, prolidine, you know, uh, it's, it's legal. Legal? Oh, really? Well, if you don't want prelodine, you can have captagon. Captagon. Oh, what is that? It's a psychotonic. Oh, you get it from the doctor. Oh, really? Oh. Oh, give me one of those then. Okay. So, uh, the first time I took one of these, I, nothing happened for a while, and I thought, where's the, where's the stage? Let me on stage. <laughs> I'm going to give everything i got tonight, man. For hours on end, I don't want to sleep ever again. And give me a beer, man, and uh, food. Well, I don't need no food, man. Give me some pills. So we, I'm exaggerating now, but uh, little things like that. There was, there was no marijuana. There was no cocaine. There was no heroin. There was none of these things. Uh, but the little white pills, the legal pills, they did help us, and they helped the Beatles too. Of course, you can get addicted to that stuff as well, but um, and we're, well, we, we survived. And I don't take those pills anymore anyway. Very good, very good. Excuse, excuse me, have you got one of those pills? <laughs> I'll talk to you after. What, what pills do you use, man? Okay, I'm going to ask you what you want to ask me. It was more a question that fate brought us together now and again, you know. Like in the time I, I went to Australia in 1964 already, because I had a, a minor hit in the hit parade in, in Australia called Why Can't, Why Can't, Why Can't You Love Me Again? And uh, so I, I went to, I flew down to uh, London and I got on this BOAC, you remember BOAC? Plane and I'm, you know, and um, the, the stewardess who came up to me, she says, are you Mr. Sheridan? She says, I've got some, some guests in the first class. In those days, the first class was completely shut off from the rest of the plane, you know. And she says that there are some friends of yours on, this, on the plane. They would like to invite you. And uh, so she takes me there, and the Beatles are sitting there in the, with Aunt Mimi. Yeah. Aunt Mimi. <laughs> And Ringo was ill, so they had Jimmy, Jimmy Nichols, Jimmy. who used to be my drummer in London yep. before. Right. And, and they're all drinking and, and smoking and, you know, and uh, maybe pills too, I don't know. 
but uh, it was wonderful to, to see them like that. So we flew all the way to Manila or somewhere on the way to Australia. So, uh, and from, from this picture here, you can, we can see that at least you met George Harrison at some later stage of his life. Yes. At the gig or something, I don't know where this is. Yeah. So, so the friendship stayed, and uh, I mean, well, like, you, like were, you were friends anyway. You were friends who played together. So why should it stop uh, when your 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 roads go different ways afterwards? I mean, well, I think um, uh, George and I, we, you know, George was very keen on learning. He had nobody to to learn from. None of us had any teachers. Yeah, there were no teachers, and if, even if there were, we wouldn't. Have, gone there, you know, we were just learning by practice, by experience, create, being creative, yes. improvising. Yes. And improvisation was something, up till that point in Hamburg, only the jazz guys were doing that. Yes. Because jazz is all improvisation, as you know. Yeah, but nobody had started to improvise on doing rock and blues and rhythm and blues stuff yeah. that happened in Hamburg. So together, we, we were sort of... Uh, yeah, he would sort of say, how do you do that? You know, what did you do last night? What was that in uh, D minus seventh? D minus seventh with a ninth, a ninth in there? And I was getting into these crazy jazz chords already. Because yeah. I used to like to, uh, to mix up the rock and roll chords with jazz chords. Yeah. Which is very effective. I got it off Ray Charles. Yeah. Are there any more? Audience questions. I, yeah, so, sorry, I just I was informed that they're waiting you for the sound check in, in right now in the big hall. Yeah. So, so we, we have to end. end uh, I think Yuri has already gone there. Yeah. And they're, they're waiting you. We, we have to thank Tommy to keep the timetable, you know. And, and thank you for. Thank you. Thank you for being here again. Okei, tehdään pieni, pieni lopetusjuttu tässä, tässä vielä. Tuota, en malta millään olla lukematta täältä matka. Tuota, en malta millään olla lukematta tästä avun kolmakkaakin artikkelista pienen jutun vielä, tuota, sieltä 72 vierailta otsikon Lapset kuin ryysyläisiä, Kalasta ja Torpala on toimittaja havainnut. Tähtien lapset olivat liikkuneet hotellissa arkipäiväisesti pukeutuneet. Heitä olisi luullut pitkemminkin Lontoon köyhellistä korttelien lapsiksi kuin miljonääriä. Joten se, jos joku haluaa...